the most popular Christmas carol is Joy to the World. The words are by Christian hymn writer Isaac Watts. It's based on Psalm 98 of the Bible. And the song was first published in 1719, and as of the late 20th century, Joy to the World was the most published Christmas hymn in North America. And who have you heard sing it on the radio? Pretty much everyone, right? The Supremes, Andy Williams, Mariah Carey, Whitney Houston, even the Jonas Brothers. This Christmas, we want you to have the best Christmas ever. And I know it's a tall ask, but why not? I mean, <laughs> why shouldn't this be the best? And to help spread Christmas cheer, we might, in our day-to-day, -day, wish people a Merry Christmas, right? When we see them, when we're out, we say Merry Christmas. It's a great greeting, and there's certainly nothing wrong with being merry. But when I think of being merry, I picture the Christmas party at Fezziwig's house in the Christmas Carol book, right? The desks are all pushed to the walls, Everyone's wearing their finest clothes, there's laughter, there's good food, there's dancing. Being merry puts life on pause. And it says, let's not worry about that. Being merry says, let's have fun. But joy, joy is different. Isaiah 9, 6 says, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given. The promised baby was going to be a sign. It was going to be a sign of the God who finally dispels the darkness. The sign of a God who expands his kingdom without war and without bloodshed. The sign of a God who sets his oppressed people free. And that alone should be reason enough for joy. <laughs> the late Oswald Chambers, in his devotional, My Utmost for His Highest, said, Joy means the perfect fulfillment of that for which I was created and reborn, not the successful doing of a thing. And I don't even know if I could describe joy or, or, I, or sum it up because joy is so much more than an idea. And it's more than a feeling. In the song, Joy to the World, it's a birth announcement. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. So rather than describe it, Maybe I can show you a picture of Joy. This is little Zelda Lee. Her parents are friends of Joanna and I. She was born this last November 25th, seven pounds, five ounces. And this, this is Joy. I told Joanna I was gonna show this picture today and she said, why the people in our church don't know them? Doesn't matter, does it? <laughs> You don't have to know them, and you don't have to be told that that is joy. Joy to the world, the Lord has come, let earth receive her king. When Mary and Joseph held their child, just like that picture, for the very first time, when they looked at that baby, you know, I think it's perfectly described in the first part of that song that declares joy was coming to the world that joy was coming in the form of the Lord. And the call then to the world was, let's receive this king. And the next part of the song says, let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing. Just like our friend Jennifer, she now has to prepare a room just for that little bundle of joy. But the Christmas song tells us that every heart Right? All of us, every heart, is to prepare Jesus' room. You know, when I think about the stress and the anxiety of Christmas, it's not Christmas that's stressful. It's preparing for Christmas. This Christmas, am I leaving some time to prepare him room? Am I proclaiming joy to the world? I mean... I don't know. Do any of us have the time? We're, we're all so busy. I mean, think about all the activities this season brings. Get a tree, decorate a tree. 
Get out the lights, put up the lights. Decorate the house, the outside, the lawn. We gotta bake, shop for gifts, wrap the gifts, attach the tags and put on the bows. Gotta make plans for that out of town trip. You gotta get Christmas cards. You gotta address the Christmas cards. You gotta mail the Christmas cards. There was an elderly widow who decided that it was much too, uh, much, too much trouble <laughs> to get all of her kids and all of her grandkids individual Christmas presents. So she said, you know what? I'm gonna save time this year. I'm just gonna get them all a card and put some cash in the card. And a few days after she mailed all the cards, she discovered that she forgot to put the cash in the cards. Now you can imagine that all those kids opening up a card from grandma with a note inside that says, buy your own presents. <laughs> when we're busy, it's easy to forget something. And it's hard not to be busy at Christmas time. So to find joy, or to have that opportunity to prepare him room can be difficult. You know, the first passage I want us to look at this morning in the Bible is in Luke chapter 1. And it's even before what we might normally consider to be the Christmas story. But if we look close, I think we'll both agree that joy is still there. Even as Mary is receiving the news that she is to be with child, Mary goes and visits her cousin Elizabeth, who is also pregnant with John the Baptist. Luke 1 says, In those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy, and blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. You know, mothers can feel the fetus kick as early as 15 weeks. As the brain develops, the fetus will kick in response to brain activity or changes that uh, the mother makes in her movement, or sound, or temperature, or any other stimulation. Luke 1 says, John the Baptist, in his mother's womb, was full of the Holy Spirit. And even in the womb, reacted to the presence of Mary and the growing promise of Jesus inside her womb. That is Awesome. I mean, think about that. In that moment, Elizabeth and John are both in the presence of the Lord. And just that nearness brings them joy. We have joy being in the presence of God simply because he is God. Psalm 16 says, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. We have joy in the presence of God because his plans and his promises are perfect. We have joy in the presence of God because he is always good and he works for our good. We have joy in the presence of God because he is a saving and merciful God. We have joy in the presence of God because he loves us. But the Christmas story of joy doesn't stop there. The second story is in Luke chapter 2. It says, an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to the shepherds, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. <laughs> Every time I think about the angels, I think, poor angels, these messengers who are sent by God. And whenever they go right? Whenever they show up, the first thing they have to say is, no, 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 don't be afraid, <laughs> right? Fear not, shepherds. Our presence is not here to instill fear. We're not here to intimidate you because that would be your first thought, right? When you see a heavenly being like, oh no, what did I do? But instead, what is happening is the, is the opposite of fear in every way. The birth of Jesus Christ is not about fear, it's about faith, 
It's not about fear, it's about favor. It's not about fear, it's about fulfillment. Favor, faith, fulfillment, all lead to joy. And the angel appears to them and exclaims, what's taking place in Bethlehem, that the birth of Jesus is happening, and they say, good news and great joy for all people. You know, we've been reading Isaiah chapter 9 for two weeks, and it starts out rough. But that's only because the people are just in a dark place. And the passage begins with the phrase, no more gloom, because Christmas is a no more gloom season. Gloom? Nope. We don't want none of that. But when Isaiah writes, for unto us a child is born, and to us a son is given, That's almost 700 years before the baby will ever be born. So by the time Matthew and Luke begin to tell their story, the people have been waiting a long time, like these shepherds, waiting in darkness, feeling alone. And then in a moment, the sky explodes with light. The announcement is made, no more gloom. (laughs) Why? Because unto us a child is born. Jesus' birth means that God is fulfilling his promise that he made 700 years ago. And Jesus' birth means that salvation is now coming for all people. Not to mention the cross and forgiveness of sins and the whole host of things that nobody's prepared for yet. So all of this, all of this gives us joy. And the joy doesn't end with Christmas. You know, the wise men show up a few years later. By the time Mary and Joseph are living in their very first home. Chapter 2, verse 10 says, After listening to the king, they went their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, And they fell down and worshipped him. And then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. These wise men had traveled a long way to find Jesus. And when they finally see the star and they find the child, the emotion that they feel, the Bible says, is joy. In fact, the Bible says, rejoiced exceedingly. That means joy overflowing. They find Jesus and they go from joy to worship. And they're foreigners. They're Gentiles. There are people from miles away and they fall down on their knees and they worship. Just like John the Baptist in the womb, their joy was just from being in the presence of the Lord. First Chronicles says, splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his place. What is the result of a joyous heart? We see it right here in the, in the wise men. They worship and they give. Remember, I said joy is hard to describe, right? So I can't tell in this passage what comes first or, or the order of things. If joy came first and then worship and then gift giving, or if the wise men were already worshipful and they were already prepared to give him a gift, and then joy was the result of it. All I know is joy and worship and gift giving, they're all tied up together in this same story. And you know, we've been saying for a couple weeks now that not everyone feels the Christmas spirit. For many, there are other emotions, there are other life events that get in the way of that joy. And that makes joy harder for them to find at Christmas time. But if you're singing joy to the world and you're having some difficulty preparing him room, might I suggest you take a page from the wise men's playbook. How can you choose joy during the trial of life? Worship and give. How can you find joy when you don't feel joyful? Worship and give. How can you trust God to turn a trial into a blessing? 
worship, and give? How can joy grow in my heart when life is harder than it's supposed to be? Worship and give. Worship and give. And, and you will find that joy is not far behind. There's one more story I want to look at. And we're going to jump all the way back to Luke right after John the Baptist leaps in the womb. And it's a beautiful hymn from Mary. Verse 46 says, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. You know, Mary may have sensed some of the difficulties that were going to come her way as a young, unwed mother. How is she possibly going to explain this to Joseph and her family? What was going on? Even in her own community, she could have been put to death if they accused her of being an adulterous woman. Even in today's rather permissive society, an unmarried woman doesn't receive a lot of joy when she finds out that she's pregnant. But we're told that Mary rejoiced. In her song, we hear her words, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Mary is filled with true Christmas joy. And it wasn't that being unmarried and pregnant made her happy. It wasn't going to be a fun nine months. And at the end of those nine months, it wouldn't be fun to make a long trip to Bethlehem and place her newborn baby into an animal feeding trough. But she was still joyful because she knew her God was more powerful than the difficult road that lied ahead. All mothers have high hopes for the futures of their children. But Mary's joy... It's not based on any human hope. It was based on God's promise. And God said that he would take away the punishment of all. And that even included her. So, no matter. Poverty, ridicule, shame, those or any other negatives, Mary knew that they would all fall away. And she sings about joy. And she sings about her son. Is there joy in your hearts and in your life this Christmas season? Do we show it? Are we sharing it? As believers, is our heart filled with this fruit of our faith? And if joy is slipping out of your lives, maybe it's time we heard that announcement once again, the announcement of our Savior's birth. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. When an angel comes out of nowhere to a young Jewish woman and announces that she is going to be the mother of Jesus, that is more than just a message for Mary. It is a message for us as well. When the angels come to the shepherds and they announce that a Savior has been born, that is more than just a message for them. It is a message for us as well. And if joy is slipping out of your life, maybe it's time to remind yourself that it was that infant, <laughs> it was that infant who was born that came into the world precisely to bring you joy. That even just those in his presence felt that joy. That was the only way they could respond. Jesus came to bring joy. He came to bring light. 
You know, when we see colorful Christmas lights on trees or houses, we see them everywhere this time of year. When we see them, they can remind us about how the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, that those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them light has shone. The birth of Jesus says no more gloom, not just to the manger, not just to Bethlehem, but to the world. The joy of Christmas is that same joy from seeing the light of the world that everyone in this story felt, just being in his presence. And if the presence of God brings joy, then let every heart prepare him room. Trust me, a Christmas that focuses on joy will truly be the greatest Christmas ever. Let's pray. Lord, it was us that decided to celebrate your birth. We picked the day, we chose the decorations, we wrote the songs. Sometimes we forget that we also create the stress. We also create the tension. We also create the expectations. And we set the bar higher and higher. But the best Christmas ever doesn't have to be about tinsel or trees or lights on houses. The best Christmas ever was that first Christmas. To have exceeding joy just to be in the presence of a promise, just to be in the presence of a Messiah, just to be in your presence, and to think of all those who got to hold you and kiss your face, what joy they must have felt. Lord, each one here has different expectations for that joy this Christmas. And we're all making our own plans and doing our own thing. Lord, we just pray right now that each one takes some time to prepare room in their hearts that we might also receive that same joy, that promised Messiah, Thank you for your son. The joy is truly ours. Amen. Hey, we hope that you've been enjoying this sermon series on the book of Isaiah, going through uh, Isaiah chapter 9 and just looking at the Christmas message that's right there uh, in that chapter, written 700 years before Jesus was born. Of course, we have uh, several more weeks uh, of Christmas messages, and we want you to be a part of that. We also have a Christmas concert tonight. That's right, our Christmas concert, our choir Christmas concert is tonight, Sunday night at 6.30 p.m. And we would love for you to be a part of that. And there's nothing to uh, reserve. <laughs> we, you've got a seat. Please come and uh, bring some friends, bring some neighbors. It's completely free. Our choir has been working on this for quite some time and they would love for you to hear this. Of course, also coming up, we have Christmas Eve services. We're gonna have two services that day, one in the morning and one at evening. They will both be completely identical. That means the same songs, the same sermon, and yes, we will even have candlelight in both services, and then our offices will be closed Christmas Day in observance of the holiday. Hey, thanks for coming out. Thanks for worshiping with us. Merry Christmas, and we'll see you guys soon. Bye.